Welcome back to the show, fellow conspiracy realists. Our classic this evening takes us to one of the dream continents that Matt, I have always wanted to visit. I got close one time. Me too. This is you too? this is the destination. If you can get there, <laughs> and not long ago, a large, uh, like a passenger size plane landed for the first time on Antarctican ice soil. Perfect. I was going to say Beautiful. soil poetry. <laughs> All but, of it. But but really think about this. It is a massive continent mm -hmm. uh, that is covered in ice, but it wasn't always covered in ice. Not always. And we're not we're not just kicking new Schwabia conspiracy ideas here. Uh it is the still the most inhospitable, most mysterious of Earth's land masses. Uh, and I love that you're pointing out this was not always the case. We recorded this episode in 2018. Uh, so LIDAR was still very much in play, but had not perhaps reached the levels of affordability and scale that it has now. And so we looked into claims that have been around for centuries and centuries that once upon a time, Antarctica was not a vast desert wasteland, but instead a home to civilizations that could give modern society a run for its money. Oh, my gosh. When ETs get confirmed, I'm just oh. I'm going to bet right now this is going to have something to do with Antarctica. I, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, man. Uh, if if you ask me, Ben, uh, what if the long lost civilizations aren't real? I would still go to Antarctica. It just seems so cool. It's just kind of hard to get there right now. But not for long. And let's jump in. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Nolan. They call me Ben. We are joined with our super producer, Paul Deckett. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, quick, as we say, peek behind their curtain. Uh, the, the four of us are actually relatively well-traveled people. Although sure. I have never been to Antarctica. Right, right. And that's the subject of today's episode. Very, very few people have been. Uh, I got very close to go into Antarctica once a number of years ago. Matt, you may remember, it was with um, with a good friend of ours, friend of the show, who does a lot of write-ups on the House of Works website about our podcast, Diana Brown. Uh, check out her work if you get a chance. Uh, she was going, her family was going to go on a group expedition. And Antarctica is one of those places that is very, very expensive to go, uh, go to by your lonesome, you know? For sure. You yeah. got to roll deep and get the price cuts. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but I'm hoping one day to get to this continent. And I think, you know, it would be a cool thing for all of us to do because of all of Earth's continents, Antarctica remains the most mysterious today. It's, it's an icebox. It's a gigantic ice desert. It's one of the last places in the world that is largely or somewhat the same as it was before what we call the Anthropocene or the age of humans. And, you know, it's no wonder there's not much uh, reason for human beings to be there. Not, not that it stopped us before. And for a lot of people, this may be weird to think about, Antarctica wasn't always a frozen wasteland. In fact, it was kind of balmy for a while. That's true. Uh, and just before we get into that, you, you can take a flight cruise to Antarctica. That's probably the easiest way. Mm -hmm. You got to fly somewhere that's closer and then get on a ship. Right. You can't fly into Antarctica, really. Not, not really. No, not easily. <laughs> yeah. It's not a Delta flight, right? Yeah. Even that thing called icing. <laughs> yeah. It, it gets worse <laughs> when you're in Antarctica. <laughs> Even, oh, man. Yeah. Even spirit won't take you there. <laughs> what about Virgin? They go everywhere. I don't know. Yeah, they do go. They are trying to go into space. Richard Branson's trying to go to space. So Antarctica is kind of like space on Earth. Mm -hmm. Similar to the Marianas Trench. There's a lot of stuff we don't know about either environment. That's a very good point. What we do know about how Antarctica arrived at this strange position, 
that works on multiple levels, mm-hmm. uh, comes from a series of theories and a lot of research into timelines. So we can we can explore that just briefly. Uh, but here are the facts. Yeah, the first thing you have to subscribe to is continental drift. Yes, that's the first thing you have to buy. The idea that once upon a time or several different times throughout the history of Earth, in times that had nothing to do with human beings, we weren't even a, a twinkle in the ecosystem's eye, uh, the continents as we know them today were actually part of larger things called supercontinents. Supercontinents. Perfect. Supercontinents because – uh, they, not because they had extraordinary powers, they were just really big. And from what we understand, they shifted into each other a number of different supercontinents about 1 billion to maybe 542 million years ago, and they formed this huge thing we call Pangaea. And the southern part of Pangaea was a place that we call Gondwana. Of course, we made these names up after the fact because, again, no people were there that we know of, right? Or at least no life form capable of naming things. And Gondwana was made up of what we call South America, Australia, India, Africa, and Antarctica today. At this point in Antarctica's lifespan, it teemed with plant and animal life. It was lousy with it. It was actually pretty hot. Uh, But around 150 to 180 million years ago, Gondwana began to separate or drift, Mm -hmm. and eventually Australia, which was still uh, attached to Antarctica, eventually Australia moved pretty quickly for continent speed (laughs) toward Southeast Asia while Antarctica finally became isolated about 34 to 35 million years ago. It went from a subtropical environment to a place just covered with ice, riddled with it. Yeah, and the theories go here that as it as it was finally separated from all of these other continents and bodies of uh, bodies of land, it's now surrounded by bodies of water in a place that so far from the equator, the ice just began to form, just starts forming, continues to form, and it keeps going. Yeah, it keeps going. So any living creatures on this continent are facing an increasingly inhospitable environment. And perhaps you eventually, because of this, get – some evolutionary traits such as what we find in polar bears and some of the other Arctic life, although in Antarctica you don't find much. Right, right. Uh, But maybe as it was transforming into this just frigid wasteland, uh, the evolutionary pressures on the animals that lived there before resulted in things like, you know, layers of body fat like a lot of Mm -hmm. seals have, you know. But let's get back to the ice. Yeah, okay. Let's let's get back. Ice Ice Baby. How did it get there? The exact story of the ice development is not certain. So we return to another theory. And the theory is that the reduction in Earth's carbon dioxide levels, as well as the changes in its orbit, caused a high degree of cooling, and that this with the formation of what you had mentioned before, Matt, the Antarctic circumpolar current, it's a neat word formed these glaciers on the land, and they grew sizable, they grew larger and larger and larger, and they began carving deep valleys in the landscape, which if you check out the right satellite images, you can see today. Yeah, and you can also see that there's this massive ice sheet uh, across almost all of Antarctica that is pretty much a plateau. It's an ice plateau. And then the highest peaks kind of peak out. See, it works on levels oh, there. there you go. Above yeah. the top of the ice. It's, a fa- it's fascinating to, to see it and to understand how much ice is physically on the land there. So what about people? Were, were there people involved in this at all? Yeah, here's the thing. I mean, uh, according to most of the records that we have, civilizations were pretty much completely ignorant that this place existed at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, humans were spreading across other continents. But Antarctica kind of hung out on its frozen lonesome, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and even in places uh, like what we call the far north of North America today, uh, Alaska, Canada and stuff, and Siberia on the other side, even in those also brutal environments, 
people were able to move around because they were able to go on land across things like the Bering Strait or yeah. the tundra. It, or at least shorter travels across, wa- across water if you had to. Right, exactly. Even if it was freezing. Yeah, uh, and that can't happen due to the open ocean surrounding Antarctica. It's like the perfect prison continent. Hey, there we go. In or, the or, you know, perfect uh, continent for a supervillain to have their icy lair. Absolutely, absolutely. Possibly hide a death ray of some kind beneath the Antarctic mm-hmm. ice. There you go. I like that idea. And it's it's interesting because there are – things uh, that we know from various ancient cultures, um, some in South America, for instance, that can be interpreted as the people having some vague knowledge of a distant cold land to the south. But the problem is that they they could be talking about islands. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there are a ton of frozen islands around there in the ocean. So we can tell you the official story that you will read in most mainstream textbooks about humans in Antarctica. Since, you know, at, as you said, Noel, we, we don't have any proof from multiple civilizations that most of them had any idea that there was something down there, right? And also, we get it. There's no up or down in space. They had no idea that there was something over there. Mm-hmm. We can't say for absolutely sure who got there first, but we know there are some noted expeditions to the area. And these timelines will become more important as we go. Most of them start in the 1500s, the 16th century, when Europeans are trying to explore more of the world and claim it for their countries or their gods. Yeah, take all of the stuff, make sure it's ours. Exactly. So we go to 1519. Oh, it was a good year. Uh, specifically in September, Ferdinand Magellan, he takes a trip, sails. That's generally how you, you get anywhere on the seas. You sail from Spain uh, towards the Indies. He was going west in a westerly route, we shall say. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's he's sailing down the coast of South America. You can imagine him going. We're, we're showing you a map right now. It's an old-timey map from the 1500s. Uh, and he discovers this narrow strait that passes through to the Pacific Ocean, which today bears his name, the Magellan Strait. Mm. Oh, it's not the... Well, I don't, I don't think it's the Ferdinand Magellan Strait. I think it's just mm. the Magellan Strait. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Ferdinand. We... Uh, didn't include that, but you do have a great story about uh, a cow um, <laughs> named after you. Okay, anyway, so to the south of this lies the <laughs> Tierra del Fuego, which is, oh my gosh, th- this the early geographers assumed to be the edge of the southern continent of, of South America. So Tierra del Fuego, and we've talked about this before. It's What is it called? The something of, I know obviously of fire, I forget the name of it. It's like, um, it has a specific thing. Because it's, it's got volcanic activity in it. The right? ring of fire. The ring of fire. That's mm-hmm. what yeah, it is. The Johnny Cash. That's song. what it is. Yeah. The ring of fire. Very cool. So 1519, Ferdinand Magellan goes a little bit south. <laughs> right. Right. And at this point for the majority of cartographers and the majority of map makers that we know of uh, – they were ranging into what would be called terra incognita. Yeah. If you've ever seen pictures of an old map or if you were fortunate enough to have seen uh, a very old map in person at a museum or in like the home of a wealthy eccentric, then what what you'll see is after a certain point, there's a blank space and you might see like a sea serpent mm-hmm. and you'll see some kind of warning that translates roughly to something like here be serpents. Yeah. Because no one knew. Yeah. No, no one had any idea. For, for me, it's like the fog of war. If you're playing a video game or something and you have a mini map and a, a map set up, you can only see what you've explored so far and the rest of it's just, hey, who, who knows? Who knows? Uh, but that was l- what humans were going through in real life. <laughs> and so in 1578, many decades later, Francis Drake, yes, that Francis Drake, passes through the Straits of Magellan only to find himself blown significantly further south than he intended due to a big storm in the Pacific. And this event proved that Tierra del Fuego was separated from any southern continent, and you could therefore sail around Tierra del Fuego if uh, the wind was at your back and you had good fortune. This 
particular passageway came to be known as the Drake Passage. And this has nothing to do with anything, but I have to ask, do you think these guys were naming this stuff after themselves? Like saying, I discovered this, therefore it's, you know, like the the Frederick Canal or something. I, or, I, I think it's by the crown probably or, okay. or at least – some there's some decree that occurs shall be known as the Drake Passage. Also unrelated, did it ever occur to you that almost any bio you read of somebody was actually written by that person? I think about that a lot. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, I think about especially in the modern day, it's absolutely true. Even if you're hearing an introduction like we would do on our show. Because we, we're not immune to this, uh, we, that bio is usually going to be constructed of pieces of a bio that somebody else wrote about themselves. Right. Most bios are auto bios. Right. It's true. We we wrote our bios on our about page. We hate writing bios, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Because you have to write in third person. It feels so weird. Yeah. It's just very like strangely self-aggrandizing. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to try to figure <laughs> out what makes you sound legit to people. Mm-hmm. I actually got asked one time at work to uh, cut some jokes out of a bio. Yeah. And then – You're like, yo, Bolin, you legit? And you were like, all right, I'll <laughs> all cut right, some of these all jokes. All right, all right, But I thought that pun <laughs> was good. No, I think there was one time – I don't know what bio problems you guys have had in the past, but I hated writing bios so much that for a couple of months here – when we were asked for bios, I would try to turn in one that just said Ben Bolin was asked to write a bio. Nice. And it never it never flew. My favorite version of you for your bios is Ben Bolin is ex, what it, uh, explores many varying and interesting pursuits or something to that effect. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, that's just the like just straight thing. up just like Ben is an interesting human. <laughs> it was, and I would agree. Oh, uh, that's too kind. <laughs> but, uh, Watch out. I'm Googling Matt Frederick bio now. Oh, you won't find me. <laughs> we'll see. So bios aside and, and whether or not these guys were self-aggrandizing – I love that phrase – self-aggrandizing enough to name these um, geographic features after themselves, we do know that they got stuck in modern culture, at least in the West. That's what they're known as today. And after the discovery of – this passage, after they say, oh, Tierra del Fuego is the end of the world as we know it, other people try to push a little further. In 1592, an Englishman named John Davis discovers the Falkland Islands. And this is messed up. Yes, this is a very unfortunate experience. Yeah, so in August of 1592, um, this guy John Davis, who was an Englishman, um, had a really, really dope name for his ship, by the way. It was called The Desire, which I like a lot. He discovered the Falkland Islands, like you said, and this was not a very happy expedition at all. Um, things got pretty dire in terms of scarcity of supplies and, and food and potable water. Uh, and the crew was forced to take advantage of their surroundings and uh, ended up having to eat somewhere in the neighborhood of 14,000 penguins. Mm -hmm. That wow. can't be right. They attempted to eat them, yeah. Well, these are also – these kind of penguins, they're, they're smaller yeah. than like the – maybe the emperor penguins that you're imagining. And aren't they really fatty? Like I would think that penguin – you don't hear about people eating penguin. No, it's not a, it's not a super fun food to eat. No. It, it's typically not a first choice food. Uh -uh. And they're hard to catch, man. Those things are so slippery. Yeah, they and slide they around in their so bellies well. and they yeah. dance so well and tandem and crazy choreographed numbers. Yeah. And there's also a question of whether or not – these penguins were familiar with humans as mm. predators, so that may have made it easier to catch. But the reason we say attempted to eat them is because once the desire reaches the tropics, the penguin meat that they had tried to store has spoiled and it's poisoning these increasingly desperate crew members. Out of the original 76 who went with John Davis to discover the Falkland Islands, only 16 members of the crew survived. Yeah, made it home. That's crazy. These are not good odds. No, they're not. Although if you're uh, if you're one of those lucky sixteen, you know you're probably riddled with scurvy. You probably had just a, a series of bad years, and you have to ask yourself: Are you going to go back to the ocean, or are you you're just going to pack it up and be a landlubber? 
a surprising amount of people, by the way, do decide to go back on the seas. Yeah, the sirens call them back. Well, it's in your blood. Mm -hmm. Must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and sky. Write in if you remember that poem or that reference to that poem. So fast forward, 1675, in April, a guy named Antonio de la Roca is blown south of Cape Horn and is the first person to see South Georgia. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Jump forward a little bit, 1739, a Frenchman, you may recognize this name, Jean-Baptiste Bouvet de Lozier. Uh, He discovers Bouvet. There you go. (laughs) He discovers (laughs) Bouvet. (laughs) So crazy. But that's such a great name. Bouvet de Lozier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jean-Baptiste Bouvet de Lozier. Mm. Man, that guy just had it all going for him. So who knows? Hey, I can't speak to his character. Right. Uh, That's fair. The island is not uh, – this island that he discovers, mm. Bouvet, it's not sighted again until 1808, so a while after he discovers it, and is due to these significant ike, uh, ice packs that end up on it and around it. Mm. Uh, and the first landing didn't take place until the American Morel – uh, there, Morel, who another explorer, landed there in 1822. So that thing went almost 100 years. So Bouvet de Lozier was <laughs> simply the first person to see it and report yeah. back that he saw it. Yes. And he okay. went, oh, hey, oh, it was definitely there, right mm-hmm. over there. And then in 1722, in February, a uh, Frenchman named Yves Joseph de, here we go, uh, Kerguelen Tremarse discovers the uh, Isles Kerguelen. So he just, they get his name. And then in 1773, Captain James Cook and company become the first people to cross the Antarctic Circle. They're still not, they, they still, no one has officially seen the continent known as Antarctica. Yeah, but they're seeing all of these islands and places around them, mm. near them enough but you just still can't see it yet. And they're all brutal. Oh, yeah. You don't want to be there. Why would you send another ship out there? It's like, again, if we want to do a video game reference, it's like when you're starting to go off the edge of a map in an RPG. And things just get less and less and less friendly. Yeah, or less and less interesting because the developers haven't put anything out there. Yeah, like in in Skyrim, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to spoil it for anyone, but... It is interesting how the – on maps, the monsters be here kind of thing yeah. really does help prevent people from exploring out there mm-hmm. in the same way a game developer will prevent you from being able to get any further. They're, sometimes it's just through uh, an invisible wall. Other times it's a like huge, you should, you have to turn back. A or, huge mountain. Yeah. It's really interesting. Or there's some games where it will just teleport you back to some other place. Oh, yeah. True. True. It's just sure. like, nope. Which can be irritating. Out of bounds. And especially because you have to go all the way to the edge in the first place. Right. Well, right. that's the thing about Antarctica. If you actually get to the South Pole, you just hit the portal and you head back up. Like, you probably go straight mm-hmm. through the Earth and end up in the uh, Arctic. You're talking about the famed Antarctic portal? Um, yeah. I'm, well, I mean, everybody knows that if you get to the South Pole, you just go, Whoop. Why do you think NASA keeps covering up the images of the actual pole? Yeah, exactly. they if you didn't know this, the Earth is kind of like a donut, and in the center it's hollow, and it goes all the way through. Come on. Yeah. It used to be a great neighborhood, but now there are tons of Nazis there. <laughs> we have a video about it. Check us out on YouTube uh, or on our website, com. So it isn't until 1820, on January 27th, that a Russian explorer named Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen becomes the first person to see Antarctica. Very nice, sir. Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen. Mm-hmm. And Schausen? I, Schausen. 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 So he, again, he just sees it. And they're like, whoa, something's there. It's way bigger than those other islands that we heard about vaguely. Yes. And officially, speculation over the existence of a, quote, southern land was not confirmed then until the early 1820s when these commercial expeditions from Britain and the U.S. and these national expeditions from Britain and Russia started looking at the Antarctic Peninsula region and other areas south of the Antarctic Circle. People just kept finding more remote, pretty pretty uh, brutal islands mm-hmm. and – 
it wasn't until 20 years after Bellinghausen that uh, someone established that Antarctica was actually a continent and not just a group of islands or an area of ocean, that it wasn't just ice. There was, there was land in them there, glaciers. Can you imagine just traveling the ocean in those frozen waters all the way around, if it was even possible? It wasn't at the time, but right. just traveling all the way around Antarctica. Because they have ships it. now that like will slice through yeah. ice, at least waters, parts like of the that, ice right? pack. Yeah. 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 Icebreakers. Yeah. 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 Those are killer. Mm -hmm. The U.S. only has, I think, one to three in operation. Yeah, right, Ben. It, it's uh, officially it's true. It's going officially to, yes. It's going to change <laughs> as trade passages open up in the North Pole. Mm -hmm. um, did we ever do anything about that? Who's going to control the North Pole? No, we we talked about who's going to. No, wait, we did. We did, didn't we? Remind us if we did. Oh this. man, it's on our, it's on our <laughs> list, and it has been forever. We got a ton of links. Yeah. Uh, okay. But um, but that's that's the state of affairs, and we can imagine. We can all imagine how bleak of a discovery that must have been, what a cold comfort it must be for all of these explorers finding these islands. Because despite the somewhat alluring names, uh, the, the fact of the matter is that they weren't – they didn't have resources that the crews could successfully extract other than means of survival like the story you told, Noel, about the penguins and the Falklands. Instead, uh, I think the best way to understand it is to imagine in your own life, listeners, have you ever been on the way somewhere and got to your destination, arrived and realized that you forgot something important and you had to turn around? Oh, God, I know. I, right? Like I live so close to where we work and I lose my mind if I have to turn around and walk, you know, <laughs> another 20 minutes home. I can't imagine sailing to Antarctica. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, I get irritated if I leave my wallet in the car and yeah. I have to well, walk yeah. all the way back down the hall to get the wallet. So yeah, well, I can relate. Dude, exactly. And and if you, you can just imagine in the early 1900s mm -hmm. for several decades, there were numerous expeditions to the act, to actual Antarctica mm -hmm. where people were attempting to do this very thing, just like get pretty far. And then they'd realize, oh, wow, I, we have to go back because – didn't pack enough we, stuff. We just ate Neil. Yeah. All the dogs have died and they were the ones who were supposed to carry us here. But it just happened over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's all part of the same motivation that we spoke about in the beginning of why Antarctica just became discovered in the Falklands and all these things mm -hmm. because there was colonial expansion occurring. Right. And in the 1900s, it's Britain again. Trying to just expand. What if you find a source of a, a rare spice or a strange animal? You know what I mean? Yeah. What if you get past some of this ice and mm. there is an actual place, some kind of oasis land like or a the, cave system? or Yeah, like the Savage Land in Marvel Comics. Very much so. So without going too much further into the early history, we're going to establish a timeline. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, from uh, for capitalism and a word from our sponsors, <laughs> and then we'll be back to explore the story of humans in Antarctica today because there are, actually are some. <laughs> All right, Antarctica today. You know who can really use the sponsors Who's that it? we just talked about? Uh, these people that are living in Antarctica. Oh yeah. Oh my you gosh. Because know, they're shipping. For most everything we we sell on this show, there is shipping involved. That's true. There's free shipping. <laughs> yeah. We should tell them. We should tell them. Yeah, it's it's home. It's home uh, to people. It's got the smallest human population of any continent. Surprise, uh, but it also has a very international. Mm -hmm. population because none of these people are citizens of Antarctica. Instead, uh, they are scientists and staff from around 30 countries. They live on 70 different bases. Uh, about 40 of those are year-round bases, meaning someone's always there. Yeah, even when it becomes impossible to travel outside of that base. Even when it's like the setting and John Carpenter's The Thing. Someone <laughs> even is worse. always there. <laughs> And the other 30 bases are only open in the summer. The entire population officially, again, of Antarctica is about 4,000 people in summer, 1,000 souls in winter. Wow. 11 people have been born there. That's it incredible. Also makes it the continent with the lowest birth rate. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. 
I can only imagine the circumstances that would lead to deciding to have your child there. I mean, what if you can't get out? What if it's winter? Yeah, there's, yeah. It so, would be pretty cool though. Yeah, it's a good story if yeah. you make it out, <laughs> you know, to be a Ooh. polar baby. So, okay, there, I know we don't yeah. necessarily have this information, sure. but I wonder in those instances of those children being born there, do they take the country that runs the base as it like the primary country that runs that base? There's, you know, who, I know we don't have the answers to this, mm-hmm. but... I, I believe, and this is just speculation, but I believe it, they get the nationality of their parent. Of the mother, I guess. Right. Yeah, makes sense. It would be cool if it was just, there were 11 Antarctica and babies. You're, you're like accidentally Argentinian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could get complicated real quickly. If you're one of those 11 people listening, or you're related to them, write in and let us know how that how that all works. Please. And so that's that's Antarctica today. That's how it got there. That's who who lives there now. And generally, they're doing climate related research, but they're doing another of uh, a, a number of other things as well. Especially because of, the, of that massive ozone hole. Right? Yeah. But other people have a question that has haunted people since the 1800s, since the official Western discovery of Antarctica. And the question is this. What if there was something else beneath the frozen wasteland, beneath all these glaciers and all these like howling abyssal winds? What if there was something there before? What if there were people there before? Here's where it gets crazy. So the hollow earth. Be- <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. The um, donut. Yeah. In this case, it's the hollow earth though. Donut theory – Slightly different thing, sometimes conflated with hollow earth. But the <laughs> – Yeah, we want to keep that the, the thing straight, <laughs> right? Well, OK, so – I'm just kidding. That's no, not where we're going. We here. should do it. We should no, do no, it. No, no, no. We're, 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 go- we're jumping right into Graham Hancock, which is I think the correct place to start. I'm, I'm, we have to do hollow earth at some point in here. We will. OK, right? All right. So, yeah, as we were saying, we're in a century people have argued with varying degrees of seriousness that Antarctica may have once been the home to forgotten civilizations. In some cases, the stories of this ancient society are conflated with other stories of places that are generally thought to be mythical, like Atlantis or Lemuria, right? Yeah, it would make a lot of sense if a lost civilization was truly lost because it's covered in ice and mm-hmm. there's no way to find it. And it's on a lost continent. There you go. How are you going to get there? And one thing we found pretty interesting, it comes from Graham Hancock, who is a, a fringe researcher who uh, writes some really fascinating stuff. I would say he is exciting to read. I and, would agree. And I, and I don't find any – I don't find major problems – with like sentence structure or thought structure, mm-hmm. he veers off a little bit sometimes. But overall, if you're going to read somebody who is writing about these kinds of topics, mm-hmm. Graham Hancock's a good choice. Oh, man. He has a great take on DNA too. Oh, yeah. Which I don't know. Did we ever? Oh, gosh. I don't think so. <laughs> we should do that. That would be a good one. Uh, so he wrote a book called Magicians of the Gods, The Forgotten Wisdom of Earth's Lost Civilizations in 2015. Incredible title. Yeah, which incredible is a great title. And it's an update. It's a sequel to a book he wrote in 1995 called Fingerprints of the Gods, The Evidence of Earth's Lost Civilizations. This book is massive. If you are interested in this sort of alternative history revisionist stuff, this what ifery is yeah. a good thing to call it, uh, then you have at least heard of this book, Fingerprints of the Gods. If you are interested in this and you have not read it, I recommend checking it out. You can get a cheap paperback copy really yeah. easily. And you can get it in pretty much whatever language you speak uh, with a lot of exceptions, but there is a good chance that you – at least can somewhat speak a language that it's translated into. Yeah, because it's in what? How many? 27. 27 languages. Sold more than 3 million copies of this book. So in the original book, Fingerprints, Hancock looks through all these creation myths and ancient texts, and he goes through these various geological scenarios, and his argument is that Antarctica moved to the South Pole much more recently than we originally thought and much more recently than the mainstream folks think today. So instead of 
um, moving like 34, 35 million years ago, getting covered with ice, mm-hmm. all that jazz. He says that it happened uh, a little less than 12,500 years ago, which means people were around. Yeah. Most importantly. And that it was it was moved not by a slow continental drift, but instead it was moved relatively suddenly by major, quote, crustal shifts, earthquakes, tectonic plates uh, subducting and crashing together and tearing apart. But like end of the world stuff kind right. of scenario mm-hmm. where – if you were on planet Earth at that time and that was occurring, mm-hmm. it's not good news. Like, yeah, like if the Pacific Rim, the Ring of Fire, uh, finally erupted and everything blew up at once, kind yeah. of like that. The kind of thing that could end a civilization if it did exist somewhere. And so according to Hancock, when this cataclysm occurred, several – remnants or groups or factions of this pre-existing ancient civilization were able to survive specifically on Antarctica at least long enough to take their – to take trips to other parts of the world where people survived and to give knowledge of things like agriculture, certain religious myth practices and folklore and stuff. Symbolic – like the symbolic – nature of certain structures Mm -hmm. and yeah, exactly. It's all the things you end up seeing in all these places. Right. And maybe to teach, um, teach the concept of metaphor to people who were having a bicameral mind period of civilization, right? There you go. So. Listen to our bicameral mind (laughs) episode. Featuring Uh, Joe McCormick. Exactly. (laughs) It's a classic, already a classic. That's a good one, right? Uh, so. Yeah, his argument is based on perceived commonalities in ancient civilizations like Egypt, Babylon, Mesoamerica, uh, the Olmecs, and on and on and on. Things like, why do so many people build pyramid-esque structures? What's the deal with obelisk? What's going on at Gobekli Tepe? Mm -hmm. It's weird. It's super weird. (laughs) It's super weird, and it it, it, uh, pushed the timeline – for humanity back much further than we thought, or at least for civilization. And so in that first book, he says uh, the tectonic shifts were the source of the ancient civilization's large destruction. But the big difference is in the second book, Magicians of the Gods, he says, uh, we looked back into it and it was actually a comet uh. that caused the damage. So he went back and forth and he points out things in, you know, megaliths, cairns, tombs, yep. this sort of stonework and masonry you would see. That are just everywhere. That's his argument. And it's not, it's not uh, taken very seriously by a lot of mainstream archaeologists do – and anthropologists even do primarily to the fact that these are kind of like Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken – these arguments are made based on his interpretation of what he sees. No one's yep. arguing that these ancient structures don't exist in these different parts of the world. Uh, but he, his argument is that according to him, they are very similar. Yeah, because he's he is making connections because there it, there is no tangible connection. So he is kind of creating. A, a, a theory about it, which mm-hmm. is, you know, one of the things you do um, in anthropology, you try and connect things up. Yeah. Yeah. But in, in his case, it's a, it feels a little more out there and it doesn't go along with a lot of the other notions or at least um, mainstream notions about how these civilizations formed. Right. Yeah, absolutely. One of, one of the things here that's very important for us to underline in the case of Graham Hancock is he's not trying to con people. He's not he's not saying things disingenuously. He He wants you to buy his book. Yeah, well of course he wants you to buy the book, but he also is not trying to purposely put the wool over people's eyes. He's not trying to bilk you. I would agree with that. Seems legit. Sounds legit then, right? Uh so we're, we're going to leave that there. The idea – that's one ancient civilization in Antarctica idea, Atlantis. Who do we have now? We've got another guy who is an archaeologist and an engineer by the name of William James Veal. Um, With and, two L's. Yeah, two L's. Right. Matt <clears throat> Veal. Matt, you are in rare form today, my friend. Oh. 
It's, I, I didn't have a response. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, yeah, so William James Veal. Um, and this guy uses uh, satellite technology to find these ruins and, and kind of find where some of these monuments might be hidden by mm-hmm. the ice. Mm-hmm. And he studied engineering at Basingstoke and Southampton Colleges of Technology and Archaeology at the University of Southampton in the UK. Um, and he uh, is a bit of a tinkerer. He designs these unmanned drones um, for surveying these completely inaccessible areas. And he has a really pretty unique title as far as I'm concerned. He is a satellite archaeologist. That's my favorite title that, we, that I found researching this because that's just got to sound great when you tell people for the first time. Wait, hold on. You just get a hold of old satellites and you like figure out where the satellite came from, how long it's been up there, which country it yeah, originated Yeah, forget from. about it. You're a satellite archaeologist over here. So do you have to go to space and then, you know, you have your chisel? No. And- Okay. You go to Jersey. Okay. <laughs> right. Sorry, you go to Basingstoke and Southampton Colleges, apparently, right? That's true. Yeah, that's it's spot on. He believes that a prehistoric civilization may have sculpted uh, huge human heads, animals, and symbols on the Antarctic terrain. In a very specific part of it, a part called Cape Adair, the northeasternmost peninsula of Antarctica. And so it's kind of like – the Nazca lines, that's mm-hmm. his argument, those um, those huge glyphs built out of earth that are only really discernible as pictures from the sky, yeah. right? Uh, which is itself a very interesting story or a very interesting mystery still. And for him, these are clearly – th- these are clearly, as Noel said, man-made monuments, and visible from the air, his interpretation knocks a whole lot of people for a loop because instantly when you hear someone say, oh, I found a gigantic face on the land. On on Mars, you mean? Right, exactly. That's what you think about, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's not his fault, but it's to a lot of people it's similar to the claims that there's a huge face or there's a pyramid on Mars and skeptics see this as an example of – we can make this our word for the day if you want – periodolia, mm-hmm. which is the tendency to see patterns in randomness. Like when you're hanging out with people and I guess an innocuous version of this would be sitting with your friends and you know, saying, oh, this cloud looks sort of like this. A turtle. Yeah, a turtle. It's, and then someone else will be like, yeah, it's definitely a turtle or someone – might say, no, no, that's clearly Christopher Walken from Pulp Fiction during the watch speech. Definitely. And then the last guy's like, nah, that's your mom. <laughs> and you're like, dude. <laughs> and someone high five. Do you have to say that every time? Every time. Uh, yeah. So it could just be the argument goes uh, that with the best of intentions, his, his brain is working overtime to make order from chaos. But he's responded to this and Veal says that he has, quote, researched satellite imagery and rock cut and scriptive material for nearly 40 years and of necessity had to develop strict criteria to eliminate frequent accusations of periodolia. So he's, he's familiar with this accusation and he says that he's been working on this for decades. He knows the difference between a random shape in a cloud and actual language written on something. He also – to his credit, invites other experts, especially if they disagree, to evaluate his findings. Um, The long and short of it is pretty simple. He thinks it's possible that about 6,000 years ago, the ancient Sumerian culture that would be located in what's nowadays known as Iraq landed in this location in Cape Adair, and the culture was the most advanced of his time. And he did ask people for help. And if you want to look at some of his research, you can go to nascodex.com. And you can go here and you can check out, I mean, it's a text, it's a long text page essentially with some images in there. And this is from Williams James Veals or Veals. Uh, it's, it's, his, it's his website, nascodex.com. And – One of the people he contacted for help is a linguist named Dr. Clyde Winters. And he said, Dr. Winters, could you help me 
I, I believe this is a language. Could you tell me what this language is, what it says, et cetera? Dr. Winters, who was a legit published academic, received these images and symbols Veal had taken from his findings, and Dr. Winters confirmed that these symbols did appear to be linear Sumerian, particularly um, passages that indicated they were talking about some great person or prophet. For some people, this is a smoking gun, but we have to remember it's possible that Winters was not viewing the actual satellite photos. Instead, he was viewing possibly recreations of the images Veal thinks that he saw in the original photos. So it may have been a, it may have been a thing where he just got a series of symbols and said, yes, these are linear Sumerian. I can tell you a little bit about what that means. Yeah, and if you go through the website and you look at some of these images, it is, I can understand where, where William is coming from, like seeing, seeing the imagery that he is showing you because it will have some satellite imagery and then what he believes like sketched out next to it, what he believes it is. And some of it does look similar. I can see the pattern that he is seeing in Mm -hmm. there. If I, if I look at his picture, right. If I don't, if I cover up his picture, I see absolutely nothing um, in the satellite imagery. So, do you if think that this makes is sense? Reading tea leaves. I I don't know. I mean, okay. he's he's obviously been doing it forever, so he true. He understands it much better than I. But uh, I don't. know. It's tough just looking at it. Well, here's here's something interesting that I surprised the hell out of me. Mm-hmm. If Okay, it sounds crazy. Ancient Sumerians making it to Antarctica. For most of the trip, it's pretty possible that they could make it because with the, the kind of maritime technology they had, they could get as far south as Tasmania, sticking mainly to coast wow. and just coast hopping. They would only really run into a tough, tough stretch when they try to go from Tasmania – to Antarctica because then they have to go over the open ocean in a very unfriendly neighborhood of the open ocean. Basically don't do that. Right. But once once they got there, that's where it becomes more difficult to believe because they would need they would need tools, time and support to build first structures in which they could live and then they would need more help um, quarrying large amounts of stone, right? because it sounds like stone is one of the things that Veal says he sees. Uh, And then they would have to be eating the entire time. Man cannot live on a penguin alone, right? Yeah, unless they were having other ships come through with uh, people they could eat. But could you live on 14,000 penguins? You could live for a while, but you probably encounter rabbit starvation. That's right. Yeah, that's a bummer. There are no no sources of citrus, right? Well, maybe seaweed? Yeah, I could see seaweed working. Seaweed is a citrus? Well, it's sources of vitamin C. There you go. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering. Vitamin seaweed. Maybe. Maybe. But that's the thing. It's still, it's still hard to believe yeah. that they would have been able to have an adequate food supply, adequate shelter. And then just built all these rock mm-hmm. monuments that are massive, or mm-hmm. at least carvings, like the Nazca Lines. Or what if it's something where they traveled down from South America in the summer? Hmm. And then they leave in the winter and come back in the summer. You know, that's if we're trying to be as generous and fair as possible. But then there's this other question. So usually when we find ruins of an ancient culture, we're going to find foundations of old buildings, structures, right? Temples, houses, palaces, etc. We're th- – those are the majority of ancient cultural ruins, it's it's more rare to just find monuments by themselves. So why would we see monuments but not see the homes of the people who lived uh, in the nearby, right? Maybe they're just so far covered by the ice. Maybe only the monuments are large enough to be visible. Well, maybe uh, Graham Hancock's 13 – less than 13,000 years ago, Williams 6,000 years ago. Maybe they're way off hmm. on how long ago – structures were there because we do know that that over time nature takes over and will erase almost anything yeah it's like weathering and just like totally wearing down mountains over time mm-hmm. i mean it's crazy but 
Yeah. I'd love to see a time lapse of that. That'd well, be pretty cool. It, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But then you have to start thinking, well, then how old have humans or at least intelligent life actually been on this planet? Right, right, which that date keeps – it seems to get pushed back further and further every decade, you know? New discoveries. Mm-hmm. New discoveries going back as far as, what, 60,000 years, I think, was one of the newer ones? It's at least close to what we're at right mm-hmm. now. So there's also an argument that we've brought nature into this. There's also an argument that maybe the ice on Antarctica is not – even if it formed millions of years ago, maybe it wasn't as constant uh, a, a presence as we have initially assumed. Interesting. Maybe the ice ebbed and flowed. You know what I mean? Waxed and waned. Maybe there were times when the glaciers retreated away from coastal areas, right? Totally and, possible. And well, ma- maybe they did that for long amounts of time. Yeah. There, there are so many possibilities I, I bet there are scientists out there going, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I've been studying this my entire life and no, you guys can't say that. Well, we don't know. That's true. We don't know. And we're not saying that the entire thing is covered with a glacier at this point. It's just – it's still inhospitable. Yeah. Uh, so we can tell you, however, about a very particular map – which, for people who believe Antarctica may be more familiar to our species than we have always assumed, uh, this is sometimes seen as a smoking gun. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll introduce you to Piri Reyes. <laughs> So, Matt, what can you tell us about this map? Well, I can tell you to watch our YouTube video on it. I can't remember the name of that YouTube video. It's but Mysterious we did Maps. Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the keywords. You yeah. can find it. Yeah. Um, it's, almost, it's, it's often referred to incorrectly as the best map of the 16th century. That it, it, people say that all the time. Right. That it's, and they say it's the best because... Uh, The claims are usually that it's the most accurate. The most complete and accurate, yeah. The most complete and accurate. Yes, thank you. Uh, That is not the case, uh, but the Piri-Rius map, R-E-I-S, P-I-R-I-R-E-I-S, was made in 1513. And just to get the, the badger out in the open here, it appears to depict the coastline of Antarctica free of ice. It appears to. It appears to. Certainly. And it all depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at the map itself, um, generally, like I'm looking at it in a vertical way. And if you go to wikipedia.com, which is probably how you're going to find an image of this Mm -hmm. thing, um, and you're looking at it, I'm trying to see which way is true north on here. And I can't tell, but it looks like it's oriented as though if you turned it uh, 90 degrees to the left, that would be north. Mm-hmm. This is hard to do uh, audibly. Yes, um, you're, doing but, it. you're doing it. But if you're looking at it, there is a landmass to the north, and then most of the rest of the map is ocean. Mm-hmm. And then you've got – am I reading that incorrectly? No, I'm reading that correctly. And then you've got another landmass that is to the south, like kind of I guess southeast to where that other landmass is above it. Um and it's thought that that landmass in the south is Antarctica. Sorry, I'm just mm. trying to let people yeah. <laughs> see it if they can't see it. I mean, it. <laughs> that's that's a really good explanation or uh, walkthrough. And it's important to go look at it for yourself. Yeah. We, we do want to hear your take on this. So this this map has been around for a long, long time. And it wasn't until 1956 that people began thinking it shows Antarctica. There was a guy named Captain Arlington Humphrey Mallory who first proposed this depicted the coastline of Antarctica. He was a retired military man at this time. He was an amateur archaeologist. He also believed in um, earlier Western arrival to the New World as it would as it would be called at the time. So he thought Celts and Vikings and other groups of people, maybe some some missionaries from early versions of the church, had arrived at the New World in various locations. What's more, maybe made maps in some cases, and that these maps 
were lost to later ages, but they were accurate, far beyond what most of Europe would have known about at the time. And to his credit, the later research did prove, like after the 50s, later research did prove that there were probably small groups of European descended people who at least made it to the far eastern coast of Canada. You know yeah. what I mean? Newfoundland and such. Yeah, the, specifically the Vikings, essentially. S specifically, um, he was right about that part. Well, and it makes you wonder if it's a long journey mm -hmm. from the area where they would be from down to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. But it does make you wonder if maybe uh, William from earlier, who was looking at the satellite imagery. Yeah. Maybe there is something there where just small groups of of – just ancient Europeans ended up there accidentally and then perished, but but before they perished, made some carvings. Or got stranded. Right? Yeah. Due to uh, the treacherous nature of the waves. Yeah. Possibly, possibly. Um, or even, you know, I don't know. We, we see so many things about um, out-of-place artifacts in South America, in the Middle East, and in, in China, and far reaches of Russia and stuff. That we can say for sure that it's 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 almost certain that different small groups of people interacted largely through trade and exploration in ways that we have yet to understand. Absolutely, that feels that's it is safe to say that it's actually very safe to say that. And your word of the day is mm. anachronism. Ah! <laughs> Is that a word of the day? I think everybody it should be. Yeah, yeah, okay. but it's fun to say. I think that's all it takes it to is. be a word of the day. It is. It is. If you want to be a real uh, pedantic nerd insult person, yeah, you can always decide to call someone anachronistic when you think they're not being cool. Yeah, <laughs> use it completely inappropriately too. Uh, but, but yeah. So all that aside, this. This map itself is an agglomeration of 20 20-something 20 other earlier maps that already existed before it was made in 1513. And most cartographers and mainstream historians today believe the map does not actually depict Antarctica. That's a bummer. It's a bummer because it looks cool. You can see how it would – you, you can see how someone could look at that and say, holy smokes, Antarctica. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a group called Bad Archaeology, and they have a great write-up on this. We recommend visiting their website for more details. Just Google Bad Archaeology Piri Race. But we do have a quote describing their conclusions about this map. It shows no unknown lands, least of all Antarctica, and contained errors, such as Columbus's belief that Cuba – was an Asian peninsula. Oof, swing and a miss. Yes, errors that not ought to have been present if it derived from extremely accurate ancient originals. And it also conforms to the prevalent geographical theories of the early 16th century, um, including things like balancing land masses in the north with others in the south to keep the earth from tipping over. You yeah, know? don't mm -hmm. want to do that. Because it's balanced on, the, on a turtle's back. That's right. True story, yeah. The the idea that the Earth itself is sort of like a um, – has its own uh, geographical equilibrium. That yeah. Too many continents on one air quote side or another will inevitably tip the scales. Because it's flat. <laughs> right. right. Um, although it was – relatively common knowledge at the time that the world was a globe. Take that for what you will. Uh, the the maps is based on are older, but they're not they're not ancient. It's not as if they found some six thousand year old Sumerian map depicting lands that had never been heard of in the modern day and said, let's just copy this, right? Yeah. At least according to uh, the different experts who have examined the actual map. So Unfortunately, Piri Reis, while being an incredibly tantalizing uh, possible indicator of ancient exploration of Antarctica, if not ancient civilizations in that continent. And just a cool map. And just a cool map. Unfortunately, it, it really is a tantalizing thing because it doesn't deliver. It doesn't, it doesn't hold up. Um, but 
we would be remiss if we did not shout out something completely different, I think a thing that we're all fans of, uh, which is... H.P. Lovecraft. Hey! The author of The Mountains of Madness, a uh, famous author, terrible person, inspired millions of people with his story. Matt, I was so taken. I was hypnotized by your depiction of these um, of these ancient pre-human races. Uh, I was going a little mad there for a moment, mm-hmm. but I'm feeling better now. You're uh, back off the mountain? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's – uh, I don't want to say it's a really well-written story, uh, but it's a, it's, it's a very um, – it, it makes a great impression. It's cool, in my it's opinion. Cool. Yeah, that's one of the best ways. It's so cool. And, <laughs> it really uh, is. And the idea there is that there is an a- there are ruins of an ancient pre-human civilization hidden in the hinterlands of Antarctica. That has not been proven, um, despite what some people have tried to depict in earlier arguments on the fringes there. Uh, H.P. Lovecraft was writing fiction. He knew he was writing fiction and he liked it. Yeah. But other, you know, just kind of like when we did, we did an episode on grimoires and we talked a little bit about the Necronomicon. Yeah. Another H.P. Lovecraft creation. He's very adamant that it's work of fiction, but people like the story so much that they want it to be real. Yeah. In some cases, they kind of slender manned it. And yeah. then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm-hmm. much like Slender Man has yeah. at least once. Yep. And then the last thing, which we don't have time for, but we'd love to uh, refer you to one of the first videos we've ever done. The Fool Society. <laughs> yes. The idea that there is a civilization or ruins of a civilization that survives some great cataclysm by uh, going underground – uh, similar to the Ben Folds 5 song, except oh. with ancient technology, and that the Nazi party and the U.S. military were both aware of this possibility. And as they were exploring the region through various um, various cover stories, through the use of various cover stories like Operation High Jump, yep. that they were instead actually exploring these the possibility of these subterranean civilizations or waging war upon one another in secret at the South Pole. Those are fascinating tales. And all in an attempt to gain the favor of whatever civilization is down there. Yes, yes. And spoiler alert there, of course, the Nazis in this tale, in this tale, the Nazi party, uh, thought that the subterranean civilization would, of course, be Aryan. Yeah, yeah. And and super into geopolitical happenings on the surface world. Yeah, because it's, you know, I have nothing to say there. It's just, it's it's messed up. It's It's an interesting story. And, you know, a lot of Antarctica has not been fully explored, certainly not to the extent that other continents have. Yeah. And we have to remember there's still parts of... Um, there's still very remote parts of the world where no human being has ever set foot that have nothing to do with Antarctica. This yeah. is this is one of the concepts that early on when we started making this show, Ben, really got me into even further into these subjects. Mm-hmm. Some of these, especially ancient civilizations, mm-hmm. uh, this one in particular. Antarctica. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, really. Be, because I could imagine a world in where it was real. Only because we found so many real things in, mm-hmm. in, in this world mm-hmm. where opposing powers have been in a, a race to achieve something first or get somewhere first mm-hmm. because the other team is going to get there. For sure, at some point, we just have to get there before them. Right. And with everything from nuclear powers to like psychic Vela. powers yeah, to the Vela incident, MK all of this Ultra, stuff. Yeah. And so this was just another <sighs> version of it for me where well, maybe there was something there or at least to establish bases oh, I'm or, so, of some sort. Yeah, I'm so sorry, man. I should have said Operation Stargate. Oh, right? yeah, Stargate. Not Correct. MK Ultra. Um, yeah, that's a great point. This, if it's not a thing a government did, it's certainly in line with the MO of most world powers. Yeah. So this leads us to conclusions, right? We don't, at this point, have any solid proof that there was some sort of permanent settlement uh, in, in Antarctica, at least not in antiquity. 
Mm. Uh, and f- we don't have proof that there was even a, a, a notable temporary settlement, much less a civilization or remnants of an ancient civilization. And this problem or this lack of knowledge is compounded by the fact that it's just devilishly difficult to do a lot of exploration in Antarctica. At least it becomes devilishly expensive. Yes. And, and, and yeah. just straight up difficult just to get any kind of transportation there. Right. And now we're in a situation where our entire species and whatever uh, eldritch species may await us under the ice uh, doesn't have to wait much longer because as the – as the Earth leaves, uh, well, as temperatures shift around the planet, uh, we know that glaciers are receding; they're losing mass. Right? It's, it's just getting a little warmer in most places, and we do know that we will see some pretty strange things when the ice actually melts, depending on where it melts. We, for instance, we don't know very much about the dinosaurs or ancient animals that roamed Antarctica when it was part of Gondwana. So all we found so far about uh, from fossil life there are going to be things that we could dig up on the margins of coastal islands or exposed mountains that have gone above the glaciers, you know. Mm. And they're the few places that don't have a thick layer of ice. We might also find sources of geothermal energy. We are almost certain to find forms of life that are almost alien to us because they have been isolated for so long. They'll, they'll probably also – this may be a little disappointing. They'll probably also be um, really small. But then you know they might, be, they might be really big like those several meter long worms. Yeah. Have you seen those? Yeah. I have. Uh, oh, that would be the coolest if it was just – giant, giant creatures that we find. Yeah. Yeah, man. And one of the new groundbreaking tools that the three of us really love to talk about when we talk about this kind of exploration is something called LIDAR. LIDAR allows us to detect otherwise invisible ruins that most people would fly over without a second glance. If there is some remnant of an ancient civilization or an ancient settlement somewhere on Antarctica, LIDAR is probably the best way to find it right now as we record this in 2018. The other prop, but the light yeah. is not perfect. It's also expensive. Crazy it, expensive. It's expensive in more uh, accessible areas. Le- uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's crazy money once you try to take that out to Antarctica. In 2017, a group did that. They were, well, they did it in 2014 and 2015, but they released the data in 2017 and it covered... 2,775.65 square kilometers of an area of Antarctica known as the McMurdo Dry Valleys. They did not find evidence of a pre-existing civilization. But for those of us who still want to hold on to that belief that such a group, community, or society existed, we can always remember this. Maybe, just maybe, this first LIDAR crew was looking in the wrong place. After Perhaps. all, yeah. After all, um, what what is two thousand seven hundred seventy five something square kilometers? That's not all of Antarctica. No, 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 no. Antarctica has a total land area of about fourteen million kilometers squared. Good God! Yeah, yeah. And we would love to hear your thoughts on where people should be looking. First off, is this bunk? Is there something to it? The stuff we looked through, you know, you can see some of the problems that people might have with these claims. Uh, But we want to know if you have something to add to the conversation. And we definitely want to know if you have visited Antarctica yourself. It's not – it's actually not that hard to get a job there on staff. Oh, well, yeah. Nobody – The Antarctica staff? (laughs) Yeah, like to be a cook. (laughs) That'd be cool. Is, are there like are there like lodges out there? Are there like uh, vacation dis- facilities? Just, yeah, that's, that's it. it that's it. Yeah, that's okay. what you got. That's you can you visit got. tour stuff as uh, like as Matt said, like a cruise mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. But, like, look how these crazy scientists spend their their days and their summers down here. Waka waka waka. <laughs> All right, now get out of here. Seriously, go leave now. Hang on, test his blood first. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but. 
uh, honestly, we, the best stories are going to be the ones that are real being in Antarctica. And then I also want to hear the most far out ideas about what you think, if there is anything beneath all the ice. I want to hear your really far out ideas. Specifically, your, yeah, go ahead. Just write it, write it out, send it our way. Because I, I, I just want to eat popcorn and dig in. But Matt, and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is one eight three three S T D W Y T K. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.